Hello and welcome in to the M&M Discipleship Podcast, where we discuss what it means to be a disciple of Christ. We aim to look for God in our daily lives, be in His Word, and strive to live out the teachings of Jesus. My name is Dakota Moody, and I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Michael Round. Michael, how are you doing this morning? Doing great, man. Doing great, man. How about you? I'm doing I'm doing excellent. Uh this is we're recording this on uh the Wednesday um after Super Bowl week. Uh, well, and so you guys are going to be hearing this Monday uh almost a week removed from the Super Bowl by that point. Um over a week. Over a week. So yes. Um you know, I I'm, I was glad at the early start this year. Could not be happier about that. I'm sure you you were even more so in central time. Um, yeah, was it it started at the same time? Started at the same time, yeah. When I mean, not not Central Time as compared to Eastern Time. Well, that yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yeah. but I felt like it was earlier. Nice. Yeah, I felt like it was earlier this year. Was it not? Does no, it always no, kick no. off at six thirty? Yeah, it does. Okay. It has forever. Well, well, there you go. Well, or it, it was either. I think even, I think years ago it was even earlier. I think it was uh, closer to six than six thirty. Yeah, I mean, the earlier that thing can can start, the better for everybody yeah. involved. Um, Central Time is nice, though, isn't it? Oh yes, yeah. For stuff like that, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was a long game, but it was still over before ten o'clock. I think it was, I think nine fifty or something like that. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. That's, that's very true. Yeah, that's <laughs> especially with true. kids and, and mm. how early yeah. I want to go to bed. I appreciate. I always appreciated Central Time whenever I was in Central Time for sporting events, um, especially being the college football fan that I am. College football playoff games, man, they are. So late, mm -hmm. especially, oh, yeah. especially Monday night, Monday night national championship game is very upsetting. To say the well, least. And the thing is, is college football is a lot longer than even the pros. Mm -hmm. and I, I'm pretty sure the playoff games are all longer than the national champ uh, than the Super Bowl. Yeah, uh, with all I'm the not even sure. And, I'm not even sure how that works out. And, yeah. Yeah. Not even sure how that works out. But yeah, sometimes those those games can just be. So late well, in that way, the clock stops after first downs. Correct, and, but, no, but well, they don't no longer in college football is that the case? Oh, that's true. That's true. That's true. They got yes. the running clock. Yeah, until however, two minutes, right? Yes, until two minutes, and then it's the same rules as before. However, um, they took those those few minutes that came off the the actual uh, real world clock and just stuffed them full of ads. So it makes no difference to us. And the disappointing thing for us college football fans is we just have less college football now than we had previously, which is frankly a little bit disappointing, but that's just the way that's the, yes, unfortunately that's the way it works. That's the priority in college football. Hence why there's already talk about expansion of the playoff, even further than the 12 teams that we've already got, because People can't get more than what they already have, even though I believe that there's only like 15 teams in all of college football that even could win a national championship in a year. But we will leave that be for a different day. Um, but as we uh, as we talk about Super Bowl, we've got that on the mind. Um, very disappointed in the result for myself personally. It's not that I'm a big hey, I was, I was happy. I'm sure. I, I, I'm sure you were. I don't know why. Any you team be. that habitually beats the Packers in the playoffs, like the 49ers have, is on my blacklist. And and. The Packers scored the most points on the Chiefs this year. And would you, would you like a medal? Them. Would you like yes, a medal? Yes, yes. We we are by proxy Super Bowl champions. That's not Green Bay Packers. Packers. That's twenty twenty four. That's some loser mentality right there. It is. It is. <laughs> it is. But no, I, oh. I just I the 49ers have been one of our nemeses, nemesi. Nemes, anyways, uh, yes. they've been our nemesis for many years. Um, going back to even before I was born, and uh, I just can't stand to see them beat us in the way that they did, and then go on to the Super Bowl. So I was happy the Chiefs won. See, I I just I can't agree with that in any way, shape, or form because I just like the Chiefs are one of the most unlikable teams in my humble opinion. Really, I yeah. find them very likable. I don't see how you can <laughs> can't see how you can find Patrick Mahomes likable with his. Kermit voice and his constant complaining. I can't. Well, see I, I will say he's 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 gone over the line a couple of times this year. Yes, he really has, and it's and I, I and yeah. Kels, Travis Kelsey in the game too was was definitely over the line, and I how mean, he was interacting with Andy Reid. Oh, and he and he, I've had I've not really had an issue with Travis Kelsey until the playoffs this year, and then how he mm -hmm. how he treated Justin Tucker 
in oh, yeah, yeah. the playoff round, like kicking his helmet away and stuff like a petulant child and then doing what he did in the Super Bowl. You know, and I and I don't really care about the whole Swift thing. I know that a lot of people have their opinions one way or the other on that. I don't really care about that, but it, he he's just been acting kind of petulant recently. And the other thing as well that somewhat bothers me is the fact that like all the credit's going to go to Patrick Mahomes, even though if like if you watch that game, there was nothing he did that was spectacular. Hmm. There really wasn't that yep. defense that they have in Kansas. Yes. That's a, that's the thing that's been the most underrated thing for years about that team is their defense is just fantastic. But all yep. the credit goes to that that guy under center because you know he he when he makes wild plays he makes wild plays and it's great. And I'm not saying that he's not the best quarterback in the sport right now because he is. Um, but the people who want to put him on the same plane of existence as Tom Brady can just go away. Can just yeah, go yeah, away. he's still got a ways to go. I mean you just line him up on a field for one game and you know, that might be a lot closer, but as far as legacy goes and everything like that, he's, he's got a ways to go before he can be there, but I mean, he's still very young and it's not, that's not to, to, to downplay what he's done so far, but yeah, yeah he's still got a ways to go. So I just, I can't, I can't stand them. Can't stand them as, as a team. Can't stand them as an organization. Also, by the way, quick aside, can't stand any team who does the stupid chop nonsense. Now I'm not talking about that. From the, <laughs> you know, the blatant racial appropriation there, cultural appropriation, but just how annoying it is. And I know there's a lot of Braves <laughs> fans who probably listen to this who are like, doo, doo, doo. I don't care. It's it's really annoying. It's one of the most <laughs> annoying things in all. The two most annoying things, in my humble opinion, in all of sports that fans do, yeah. number one is the chop for either the Braves or the Seminoles or the Kansas City Chiefs, any of them. Number two is cowbells. Can't oh, stand yeah. cowbells. <laughs> cannot stand cowbells in any way, shape, or form. I mean, I just yeah. don't get it. And, and and I'm not and I'm not um somebody who has a rival team that uses cowbells. Like I'm not an old Miss fan who really hates Mississippi State. I just can't stand. It. I couldn't imagine being in a stadium like that. And now that Texas is in the SEC, I plan on going to some more games that Texas will have because I'm I can be Southeast regionally and so I can go to some of those away games. That is not one. I will never go to Mississippi <laughs> State. I mean, because first off, who wants to go to Starkville at Mississippi anyway? Um, number one. And then number two, those cowbells are just atrocious. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah. For for me, like cowbells reminded me of high school football uh, in kind of a, a nostalgic sort of way. Uh, I don't know. Did I, hmm. I don't remember Pisgah playing a team that had cowbells. A lot of people just do, do, uh, Just randomly just have them. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. also because we're in – we were in North Car- well, I mean, we're also in country bumpkin areas with some <laughs> some people who just add cowbells. Well, it was like the uh, what was it, the Vuvuzelas of old, but the board the Vuvuzelas, <laughs> the Vuvuzelas. Now that, that was, was nuts. That was awesome. Yes. Yeah. And by the way, by the way, just a little quick aside as well, a little dig here as well. Third place on my list of things that I can't stand the most in sports is every time I watch one of those stupid USC junior games and that rooster comes on this loud. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 Can't stand that's it. Third down. Stand it. Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. Well, a rooster's so... a mascot. No, actually, no, you know what? No, what? No, what? I'm going to put that fourth. Actually. The third is actually the, the, the grown men barking like dogs at Georgia. That's, that's probably third. Yeah. Actually. I'll put that above the rooster. So uh, anyway, well, anyway, so we're, we're talking about the Super Bowl. We got into a, a tangent. Yeah. I'm sorry to all this is out there, but but Mike, why don't you introduce? The, yeah, so, we're both seeing God in this this way. Yeah, and I know we're going to get into different opinions on this uh, as we get into this. But <laughs> one thing that's on the minds of a lot of people is the He Gets Us campaign, where uh, people have been uh, sharing commercials, especially with the Super Bowl, and they were pointing out different things about Jesus and how Jesus relates to us and the the ad campaign has been going on a while it's just people are really noticing it now because it's on the super bowl um they paid a lot of money at the number i saw i i think was like 17 million um or maybe that was just the going rate for super bowl ads it was a long Um, commercial it was like a full minute i think yeah right about washing feet and pointing out how jesus did not promote hate uh bigotry things like that but he washed people's feet and it goes through a lot of images of different people washing different people's feet. And what I would say about where I've seen God um, in that, not 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 any kind of commentary on that yet, but just people, whether it was good, bad, or indifferent, people are thinking about Jesus. 
I've, I've heard that more people searched for the name of Jesus than they did on Christmas. And so pe more people are interested in what Jesus was about. And whatever you want to say about Christianity, even huge thought leaders, Gandhi, Napoleon, uh, others over history thought a great deal of Jesus. And I, you know, obviously we're, we're Christians. He is the one we are following. And if more people were aware of Jesus and what he did and what he stood for, that would be a good thing in our world. Yeah, it's uh, it was, it's kind of, it, it is an interesting thing. And, and frankly, there's a lot of outrage about this because of like, the fact that it happened during the Super Bowl, and so it was a ex very expensive commercial, and all the money that kind of came with that. But but also, if you've been watching sports kind of throughout the year, um, I know especially, I mean, you know, I watched a lot of college football. There's a lot of these ads that came up, the, the Jesus ads that have been go going up. Um, and many of them are better than... Yeah. Well, and I think that they've all they've all had kind of good points at different times and everything else like that, and and they've they've carried that good a, a good message because I think they try to be kind of they don't want to go into too controversial issues. They're just like, hey, just meet our Jesus, um, and that's the kind of way that it works. But a lot of the you know there, there's a lot of people who have a lot of outrage with this and a lot of reasons, and I think that the the stated reasons why people say that they don't like it um, are usually not actually what their issues are with it. Either one side of the coin is you don't want you you are somebody who is not a Christian and you don't want these Jesus ads. And so you will try to find some way to make it uh, seem unwholesome that they even advertise during those times, whether it's people talking about the amount of money that was spent. Oh, how many, you know, how many homeless people could you have ha housed or fed or whatever with that money, blah, 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 blah. That's one side of the coin. And then you have other people who are Christians who do not necessarily like completely agree with the message, which first off, if you don't agree with the message, I don't, we can talk more about what the message actually was and what the issues were with that. I, I find some issues with having an issue with that particular message because it, it was just a very simple statement of wash, let, let's let's make sure to wash, uh, that we're spending less time looking at people in judgment or in dislike and more time serving and loving people because that's the way that we really get into people's hearts is that way as I feel like was the context of that message. Um, and we can get more into that in a minute, but also there are people who are Christians who have stated, okay, well, why couldn't you have spent that money other, uh, otherwise potentially and doing other good things for the Lord? But I also disagree with that message as well for multiple reasons. Number one, how did they get this money? Was this given to a church and then a church spent that money? Or was this money deliberately given from from people or whatever groups this money was gathered together to intentionally go towards an ad campaign right right to spread the name of jesus in this way give awareness in the way of jesus and and i think if if that's the situation then why is this an issue because right. if people are, are are wanting to give their money for this and by the way bring more awareness to the to to the name of jesus than you mm -hmm. could do in many other ways. I mean, you, you, this was the most watched Super Bowl ever, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. And so that means a hundred and whatever twenty million people saw that ad. And in the Super right. Bowl, people actually watched the commercials and what? Yes, to. yes, they're wanting to watch the commercials, and it was, and it caught the attention and eye of people. Yeah. As you see everything that's being said there, and as you say, if more people. Are are googling the name of Jesus based off this than than ever before? You talk about the value of the ad, maybe seventeen million or whatever it is that they they paid, whatever it, it is that they paid. If a few souls went to church and reconnected with a faith that is lost to them because of that ad. Or their or curiosity was, or yes, or, or their curiosity was piqued to be able to open their Bible for the first time while, or whatever it may be, it jogged something within them. Then isn't that worth it? Isn't it worth it that that happened, right? And so that that that's that's kind of my thoughts on the the, the argument around the value of the ad. Well, we're going to also <clears throat> concede some things later on in the episode today. So please stick yeah. around um, yeah. because specifically what I'm reading will, I think, um, 
we'll go further into this. But first, we're, we're going to go through uh, our passage of Scripture in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, I think fairly fitting. relevant. Yeah, yeah. very fitting. Uh, in Matthew chapter 7, I'm going to go ahead and read Matthew 7, uh, 1 through 6, which says, and this is where we are in the Sermon on the Mount. We didn't cherry pick this. <laughs> we did not. This is very true. It's, it all, it it's says, all judge up. not. <laughs> you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye? But do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So as we read this, Dakota, what, what are your thoughts uh, initially as you, you think about it? Um, one of those passages of scripture that uh, is one of the most taken out of context in all of all of scripture, um, <laughs> if not the, <laughs> if not the, yeah, it's it's one of it's it's up there because I've heard a lot of people just use that first line, "Judge not that you may not be judged," line as it regards a lot of things, uh, especially people who are outside of faith will use that line um, in stating why people of faith should not express their views on morality. Um, and, and I think really more than anything, I, I think this should be a statement to us in saying, um, whenever we are to judge people, first off, we should look at people within the within the church, first and foremost, as the people we are supposed to help to be better in their lives of faith, including ourselves. And we should be receptive in these ways also. Um because I do feel like there is a lot of issues where people in the church judge the world by the standards of the Bible, which do, they do not attest to or believe. Right. Uh, we've lost audio on you there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, yes. I'm good. Yeah. Um, I totally agree with that. And before you move forward, Paul yes. actually said that. Yeah. He's, he said, for what have I, in 1 Corinthians 5, 12, for what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? And he's talking about sexual morality, greed, idolatry, reviling, drunk or drunkard, swindlers. So, yeah, I mean, like, we can't expect the world to live righteously. No, and we shouldn't be surprised when the world lives like the world. When the world lives yes. worldly, that should really just be common sense expectation, right? And so— I do think that there is something to the to the extent to where we don't we shouldn't be gatekeeping society when the world is going to act like the world. Really, the place where we should be focusing any sort of eye towards helping other people to better their faith should be inside the church in this yep. way. Um, and that comes by also first making sure that we are in a position to uh, help them in these ways. I think specifically in saying this, if you tell your brother not to do a particular act, but you are also part of that same action or something similar, oh, yeah. that's where we can run into issues in this way. And this is kind of where we get into the problem where people will say, well, I can't be, I'm not perfect. And so um, I can't, I, can, I shouldn't say anything to anybody because mm. I'm not perfect. Well, it's not about being perfect. It's about trying to help others in their particular sin issues, but don't be judging somebody else and saying that they have a sin issue when you have a very similar issue of your own. And I'll say this really quickly, then I'll let you continue on with that thought, Michael. For example, if we say you are in a, um, a, a an immoral sexual relationship, either with somebody of the same sex or somebody who is of the opposite sex, but outside of marriage or any of these sort of ways, an adulterous relationship, you are in sin, you are wrong, but then you also consume pornography. Yeah. You are still guilty of sexual morality just as much as they are. Right. Right. It's the only difference is yours is probably private. Theirs is more public. Yes. And so you judging them, hence the 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 term about trying to take something out of their eye when you have something in your own eye. That's what we're talking about. Mm. I think. So well, and, and one of the about. one of the hallmarks of self-righteousness and um just pride and, and arrogance and judgmentalism. One of the hallmarks of that is low self-awareness. 
I mean, that's exactly what Jesus said. If that individual with the log in his eye had stepped in front of a mirror, he'd say, whoa, I've got a log in my eye. Everything should stop. And I should try and get this log out of my eye. Like if I literally had a log in my eye, nothing else would matter in my life. No, I would be get. But it's people that aren't self-aware that aren't standing in front of that mirror that say, oh, look, Dakota, I see that speck in your eye. You need to get that out here. Let me help you with that. And that's where we get into problems. Also, something that I've been saying for years is if you have a log in your own eye and you try and help a brother get a speck out of his, you're going to beat that brother up with the log that's in your own eye. It's just not going to work out. Mm -mm. No. Yeah, I, I think that's that's absolutely correct. And 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 I, I think one of the key ways in which we can be better Christians, all of us, is to be more self-aware. Yes. Very simple. Like being more self-aware about how we act, about how we how we present ourselves to other people, how we present ourselves to the world, how we yes. talk to them, how we interact, what sin issues we have that we are maybe excusing or finding excuses for um and allowing in our lives. Being self-aware is vitally important because how can you fix a problem that you don't know you have? Yeah. Yeah. When right. part of that is, is communicating with other people and about yourself, asking questions. Yes. Uh, but what I would and say being that, open to receive that criticism as well, by the yes, way. Yes, yes, yes. Allow the gospel, allow Jesus's life to be a mirror for you and say, okay, how am I comparing to this, to Jesus? Uh, rather than how do other people compare to Jesus? Yes, it's it's a fundamental shift. When we're reading the scripture, are we reading it for ourselves? And that how can I submit and yield to this passage and and follow Jesus? Or is this you know how can I apply this to teach other people how wrong they are? Mm. Um, big mm. big differences. Yes. Big differences. Yes. Are you are you using the word to be a a life preserver, a life saver, or are you using it as a weapon? Right, 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 right. Hold are people you, down. Yes. Are you are you using it as an anchor to weigh people down or are you using it as a life preserver to lift them up and say that's that's, I think, a, a big difference in that way. And, and the final final thing I'll say is with as regards to self-awareness thing, I think this is important for that last sentence. Do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. There's a lot of interpretations about what that sentence means, but I think part of that is certainly if you try to to help somebody who is not self-aware. Um, you try to help them in that way, they can absolutely stomp on your pearls of, pearls of wisdom and turn to attack you in that yes. way, right? Um, I think that's very important. And also, when you're dealing with people of the world, you can try to give them help in in the ways of showing them holiness and righteousness, but they can also get very upset by that because, again, Jesus has promised us people in the world are in the darkness and they resent the light. And so when you show them the light, they're going to initially be very agitated at you. That, oh, yeah. I think, in both of those contexts, I think that last sentence can apply in that way. You can give somebody some pearls of wisdom from God himself, but if people are not willing to listen, they're going to trample those thoughts and those ideas, run right over them, and then run over you afterwards. Yes. So, and, and kind of in closing, as we move on, just think, what measure are you using to measure others? Would you be yes. comfortable with that measure being used to you? Yes. Um, I think that's an important passage uh, to keep in mind. So as we go into what we're reading, uh, we think about that. Um, what is it that you've been reading, Dakota? Yeah. So before we get into the the fun that we're going to get into with your um, kind of connecting your thoughts from your what you're reading to what we were talking about earlier, um, I want to talk about really one of my absolute favorite books. And I, I have on my shelf here underneath my Palmetto Bible Camp Cup. I've got three books that I usually keep here. There's only two here now because I'm reading one of them right now because it's some, I like to go through these books semi-regularly, um, especially, especially, especially this one because it's as practical as you get. Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. If you are a Christian who's seeking that next level of your faith, read Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. It's amazing. It talks about spiritual disciplines, the thing that we don't really talk about that much in church, um, things that are going to help take your faith to the next level. And with that in mind, I need to read this regularly because there's a lot of spiritual disciplines he talks about, some things that are very basic and essential to the faith of Christians everywhere. And recently, you know, and he talks about things from better praying practices to better studying practices and things like that to some other ones that can be kind of interesting, like silence and solitude and sacrifice, things like that. But 
I'm there's a spiritual discipline that I'm looking to practice that I'm wanting more help with, and I'm reading back through his section on this because it is so important when he talks about fasting. He mm. talks about fasting and the essential nature of fasting and what that looks like to the modern Christian because we just do not fast in our modern day. And, and, and before I get to the actual quote that I was wanting to share, I want to read the very first sentence he has in this past in this uh, chapter about fasting. He says, in a culture where the landscape is dotted with shrines to the golden arches and an assortment of pizza temples, fasting seems out of place and out of step with the times, right? And again, I've talked about this before. One of the sermons that I got the most pushback about was when I talked about fasting. And I said, when Jesus talked about, and when we fast, not if we fast, and how essential really people throughout the history of faith in God have found fasting and what that means to us. And I think this is very important for us to be able to understand it. So for me, I look into fasting and I look at, at how much it can help in the lives of Christians, because here's the thing. In Titus chapter 2, when he's talking about what the examples of every person in the church should should have, from the oldest man to the oldest women to the young women, there's one common word that just keeps popping up, and the young men's well. Self-controlled, 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 self-controlled. And at the end, he summarizes the whole statement. And what does he say again? Self-controlled. And there is not a single practice, I think, that can help us better with self-control than fast. Because we are denying ourselves something that we want that is not always, by the way, needed. Wait, our body convinces us that it's needed, but it's not always needed. And we deny that and we turn our attention to God because that's true fasting. Intermittent fasting is fine, but that's not godly fasting, right? Now, if you use your intermittent fasting and turn it to godly fasting, that's fine. But it's not just skipping a meal. It's about using what that, that time that you would be spending in that meal towards God. And he makes this quote. He says, fasting helps us keep our uh, our balance in life. How easily we begin to allow non-essentials to take precedent in our lives. How quickly we crave things we do not need until we are enslaved by them. Paul writes, all things are lawful for me, but, not, uh, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Mm. And in this... We as Christians need to be on the lookout for the things in our lives that are enslaving us, things that are not maybe sinful on their own, but have become that because of how they enslave us, whether it is our food, whether it is our social media habits, whether it is our, our news habits, whether it is whatever it may be that has enslaved us, but we passed off as being fine because they're not sinful on their own, but they have enslaved us to the point where we have so built ourselves up on the unnecessary things of the world. Not to say the food isn't necessary, but not all the time is food necessary, right? And in that way, anything that's like that, this, social media, our phones, news, anything like that, once we build our, those temples to those things in our lives, how quickly we can go away from God and make those things our gods. Mm. Yeah, and this is a problem that's been going on for a long time. Um, Richard Foster, uh, what what year did he write that? I think it was in the sixties or seventies. It's, it's it's been a while ago. I know that this is the technically the the special anniversary version, um, but I think it was probably seventies. I think so. Yeah. So I, I listened to a podcast, and we uh, nineteen seventy eight. Nineteen seventy eight. We like to think, yeah, seventy eight. That's it. That's it. We like to think that the spiritual malnutrition using the fasting malnutrition of our country is a recent thing that we are our, our our christian decline has gone down well i listened to a podcast kerry newhoff was interviewing john mark comer and he cited a conversation with richard foster after he wrote that book he wrote that book and then went on a book tour and he was speaking to churches and he found that he was so disappointed with the spiritual condition of our country and that was in 78. And so this is a problem that's been ongoing. Yes. Uh, and this really introduces a, a greater discussion. And it will be what we end up talking about from 
the book that I'm reading, but we don't have time today. And so we're going to actually have to turn this over <laughs> into an additional episode that will come out uh, later, maybe even the next week. Um, but we'll, we'll introduce and we'll, we'll spend the whole time discussing discussing um, the, the, the spiritual condition of our country in yesteryear and talk about how things like the He Gets Us ads and stuff like that, that the, the, the public does or that the greater number of people does, it, it's going to be, uh, it's not going to be as far and as much as we as serious believers might want it to be. And so we'll have a, a good discussion about that. Uh, and we hope you will join us for that. Any other thing about fasting? I think that's a really th good thing about how, you know, like you said, that's a, a way to help improve and grow in our self-control. That's, I think, an important way of looking at that. Yeah, I, I I think once again it's it's that it's that kind of key thing and that that we can do in our modern society, which has been kind of told, well, you must have three meals a day and you must have snacks in between and you must have all these sorts of things. We have really latched on to the things that are not necessary. And because we have so much, it is so hard for us to give that up almost. Yeah. Right. If you think about the society that Jesus was in, it was a lot easier for them to kind of give up food for a day when there was already some days where they couldn't eat anyway, right? And right. it seems strange to us because we feel like being at a need would would make us like overindulge, where it's really the other way around, where we can become so gluttonous that it's hard for us to give up the other direction. And I think that's so important for us. It sets the template, our stomachs, right? As, as Paul kind of made that comment before about our stomachs have become our gods that way. Our stomach, and he meant that, not necessarily in just the stomach way, but in all kind of our core, Hedonism. our gut, our being. Yes, yes. Anything, our, our desires can become mm -hmm. our God. But one of the first ways that, that does start is in the stomach, right? It's yeah. li literally physically indulging in, in taking things and how quickly that can turn uh, anything in our lives in that way to something that enslaves us, whether it is food, whether it is social media, there's things we talked about earlier. And then, of course, the sinful things as well, you know, pornography, you know, whatever else it may be, like those things can absolutely greed. overtake us. Yeah, greed, alcoholism, anything like that. It can overtake us and take and tear us away from God in that way. And so that's mm. just where I do think it is very, very important for us to try to look towards God and see what we can do uh, in our lives to better please Him, including what we can take out in our lives and fill up with the things of Him. So absolutely, with that, yeah. With that thought in mind, Michael, why don't you uh, send us out? Yeah, yeah. And one last thing, the self-control is one of the fruit of the Spirit. So pray, ask God, ask the Spirit to, to give you that self-control. So we thank you for joining us today on the m, m Discipleship Podcast. Until next time, let's look for God, learn from His Word, and live out His teachings. Bye for now.